It's great to be in this place. We are in the sixth week of our series in the book of James. Whoever came up with gym class is brilliant. I can tell you that. You know, I used to preach out of James, and I'd have series in James. I would call them a series in James. That's how I did it. But somebody's really bright here. And I am humbled and honored to be here. It's a great opportunity uh, to share with you from God's word. I miss Danny. Do you miss Danny? I miss him. I was going to kind of stand up here and say, hey, I'm an old Danny. <laughs> it didn't work. Okay. I'm honored that uh, Pastor Danny and Pastor Andy would entrust me uh, with this task. It's a humbling experience to stand in this place where uh, pastors and uh, our pastors and other pastors and preachers have shared God's truth in a deep and meaningful way. Amen. You know, uh, when I was younger, uh, before I became a pastor, uh, my wife and I traveled. I was back then, they called us song, song evangelists. That's what we were. Uh, now I think there's a different name for it. It's a contemporary Christian artist, that sort of thing. But I, I sang in, in churches all over the country and did concerts and all kinds of things and met wonderful preachers and, and powerful evangelists preaching. But I want to tell you, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we have one of the finest preachers in the country right here every week, and that's Pastor Danny. Give it up for him. You uh, do not know how blessed you are <laughs> to have a pastor uh, that speaks the truth and the word like Danny does. Before I share from God's word today, I want to, um, to tell you about a dream I had last night. Now, I'm getting older and the dreams are becoming more vivid. <clears throat> I used to dream in black and white. Now I dream in color. <laughs> all right. I don't know what that's all about, but uh, I dreamed last night that Pastor Danny and Pastor Andy and I died. And we are getting ready to go into heaven. We are going into heaven. And, uh, but God placed this big lake out in front of us. And depending on what our sins were in our past life is how high the water would come up on our body. So I was a brave soul. Actually, I wasn't brave. They pushed me. They made me go first. The oldest guy always goes first, you know. So the water gets up to my ankles, to my knees, to my waist, my chest, my neck, and I'm getting a little worried whether I'm going to make it or not. And I turn around, and I cannot believe my eyes. There's Andy walking on the water. And I say, Andy, I know a little better about you. I don't know if this is true or not. It can't be true. And he's, I'm standing on Pastor Danny's head. All right. Well, this may be the last time I ever do anything in this church after that, right? <laughs> Let's look at our text today. It's found in James chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 18. It says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be fake to the truth. In other words, it says, don't lie there. Next. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good works, impartial and sincere. And then verse 18 says, And a har harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Well, let me tell you something. I really like James. I, I like the way he writes. I, I like him because he writes like an ordinary human being. He says things like you and I would say them. And what James is doing, he is reminding Jewish Christians here, wherever they are, how to live the Christian life. James knew that living the Christian life was not easy to do. And so he addresses two kinds of wisdoms, a worldly wisdom and a godly wisdom. 
Now, you know, the word wisdom is a very strange word. It, uh, it isn't something that we talk a lot about these days. We live in the information age, amen? Uh, we have at our fingertips more knowledge now than any other time in history. More <clears throat> information has been produced in the last 30 years than in the last 5,000 years. Think about that. That's amazing. T today, information doubles every 13 months. Now, I was surprised to see that. So that means all the information we have right now, in one year, there's going to be that much more. Isn't that unbelievable? Now, today we have this little thing here. I, I remember the 356 computer. Anybody remember that? <laughs> I may be the oldest guy in the joint here today. <laughs> uh, it could spell your name and play Pong. I mean, that's about as good as what. But this little thing holds a plethora of information. Amen? I wanted to make a dump cake the other day. Now, I'm not a great baker. I'm a pretty good cook. I like to cook. But I'm not a great baker, so I looked it up. There were like 1,013 dump cakes on there. I picked one. It had three ingredients. It was the worst dump cake you've ever tasted. I left out one ingredient, and I don't know how, but it was awful. The point is, there's so much information, you cannot even fathom how much information. And since the arrival of the Internet... We have more knowledge than we can possibly handle. The world has plenty of knowledge and education, but not much wisdom. Our education system is more advanced than it's ever been. And yet there is more immorality, suicide, and violence than ever. The youngest people in our culture have no problem getting around the Internet and, and really have no problem with the computer uh, we have 20 grandchildren, and I, I know most of their names, <clears throat> and um, <laughs> I know this one in Florida, his name is J.R., he's 12 years old, he has a complete control of the computer. I've never seen anything like it. If, if I need to ask a question about someone who knows something about it, I call him, 12 years old. Can you imagine that? So... Fewer and fewer people, however, know how to run their lives. They can run a computer and have no idea how to run their life. There's lots of knowledge, but not much wisdom. In fact, uh, wisdom can often be learned from those who are, have very little education. Take children, for example. Patrick, age 10, says, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> Pretty wise. And then Michael, age 14, says, when your dad is mad at you and asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> That's a wise guy. And you know, he was also wise enough to say this. He says, and never tell your mom her diet's not working. <laughs> yeah. And then you have Randy, age nine, says, stay away from prunes. Now, I'm not sure why, how poor Randy discovered that bit of wisdom. And then you finally have, I think her name is Sarah. No, Olivia. <laughs> Olivia says this, don't let your mom brush your hair when she's mad at your dad. <laughs> Joel Age 10 says, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. And then Eileen finally says, never try to baptize a cat. That's a good one. All right. Well, there's a little bit of wisdom from you. Although there's a lot of wisdom what these children have to say, there's much more to wisdom than this. As a matter of fact, the whole book of James explains the purpose of trials in the life of a believer. And it's been said that the book of James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, Andy hit on that last week, and I, I believe that to be true. Listen, in order for the purpose of God to be worked out in a believer's life, one thing is required. You have to have wisdom. 
James chapter 1, verse 5, here's what he said. He said, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given unto him. So what he's saying here, James' advice really is simple, very simple. Just ask. If you want wisdom, ask. So when we look at James chapter 3, verses 3, 13 through 18, all you have to do is read that scripture once to understand what James is trying to say here. He's talking about wisdom. Not only is James talking about wisdom, he does make a comparison between two wisdoms, worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. So the question for us, and I want you to think about this today, which wisdom is controlling your life? Which wisdom? Is it a wisdom that comes from God and is pleasing to him and pleasing to others? Or is it a wisdom that does not come from God, is not pleasing to him, is not good for us or anybody else? Think for a moment of someone in your life who has shown wisdom, whether it's godly wisdom or worldly wisdom, and not by their words, but by their actions and deeds. Everybody can say they're wise, but most people do not live wisely. The best example of a person who lived uh, and exhibited godly wisdom in my life was not a great statesman. Uh, he wasn't a best-selling author. He wasn't an inventor. He wasn't a wealthy businessman. He wasn't a scientist or a great scholar. And while there are individuals in those categories who might have godly wisdom as as well as great knowledge, the person that best fits James' definition of godly wisdoms to me is a man named Dr. T.L. Mathis. Now, I doubt if anyone of you here has heard of Dr. Mathis. He was born into poverty of 16 children, cotton farmers in Madisonville, Texas. He rose to achieve a doctorate in theology. He pastored a church, the same church, in a small community in Houston, get this, for 54 years, the longest running pastorate of anybody in the Baptist Association. Longest running pastor, 54 years. He became known as the walking Bible in Houston. Imagine this, he, he actually committed the entire Bible to memory. You couldn't stump him. I tried. I went to the begats, and he still knew. He may not know every little word, but he could tell me exactly where that word, verse was found in the begats. Can you imagine that? So what made him wise? It wasn't his vast knowledge or the degrees he had. It was a life of humility and integrity that he lived among the people that he pastored and served. So what made him wise? It was sharing his personal testimony of salvation with a homeless man in a mission in downtown Houston. It was encouraging a young man who lost his job, or praying for over a sick child in the hospital. It was mentoring a, a, a young mysterious student, a preacher boy, as he used to call them. What made him wise? It was delivering food to a family who was desperate for food, or teaching God's word on a Wednesday night to a small group of young new believers. It was listening to a young person who was questioning their faith. For you see, the way you will know whether someone is wise or not is not by what they know. It's by how they integrate what they know into how they live. We might call that life wisdom. He had it. Truly, this man who has gone on to be with the Lord, was a wise man. 
his life and his actions, his selfish and selfless deeds always pointed others to God and away from him. And by the way, that man was my father-in-law, Dr. T.L. Mathis. <clears throat> he gave me a great gift, by the way. My wife is sitting right back there. <laughs> And uh, I hope you get to talk to her. She's amazing. I married way up. Trust me. She graduated summa cum laude. I graduated thank the laude. <laughs> but anyhow. <laughs> Listen, my father-in-law was so, he, he was so humble that he would be really upset with me right now. <laughs> he would be upset that I was talking about him. He would say to me, tell him about Jesus. He was wise. He'd really be <clears throat> unhappy about what I'm about to tell you right now because uh, there was not a prideful bone in his body. Uh, the Texas Museum called that little church in Denver Harbor, Texas right in the middle of Houston. And they asked if they could have his pulpit. They took his pulpit and put it in the Texas Museum. And now you can walk up to that pulpit, push a button, and still hear him preach. He still shares the good news that Jesus Christ still saves. Amen? I hope you get to go there and hear him sometime. I think it's in Independence, Texas. I think that's where that's at. And by the way, he's been in heaven for 26 years, so he's still preaching. <laughs> and I guarantee if there's someone not saved in heaven, he's going after him. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. <laughs> Dr. T.L. Mathis was the wisest man I ever met, and he was also the most godly man I ever met. He lived a life of godly wisdom. I'd like to look at both uh, worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Let's, for, let's look at worldly wisdom first. Worldly wisdom is marked by bitter envy and selfish ambition. It's all about living at the center of your own life and making sure the world revolves around you. There are people living this kind of wisdom and still consider themselves Christians. They think that God is all about them. They think God centers his life around them. But eventually, God becomes unimportant to a person like that. Listen, if God is centering his life around mine, then that makes me the most important thing in the universe. And people living in worldly wisdom by the way, are really touchy people. <laughs> they don't want anybody to tell them how to live. They, they don't want anybody to judge them. They brag about the way they live their life, but they brag in spite of the fact that their world is falling down around them. When we find ourselves at the center of our relationships, when we find ourselves at the center of everything in our lives, the result of that is misery. And people who are living worldly wisdom, not only do they boast, but the Bible says that they are liars. Have you ever met people who are doing it their own way? Have you ever met people who say their life is great even though you can look at them and tell that it's obviously a mess. John chapter 3, verse 15 says that this kind of wisdom doesn't come from heaven. So the question is, are you worldly wise? James uses these words in verse 15. He uses the word earthly, unspiritual, demonic 
Now, I, I want us to use these three words to, uh, as a little test to see if we're living worldly wisdom. The first word, earthly. James claims that this wisdom is earthly. It isn't interested in what's everlasting. It's just concerned with the here and now. So think about the decisions you are making, especially in terms of your relationship and your money and your time. Are your relationships as well as the things you spend your time and money on, are they going to last or are they just for the moment? Did you realize 100 years from now, none of us are going to be here? Now, I'm the oldest here, probably. I, I don't think there's probably anybody older than me. My grandkids say I'm older than dirt. I don't know what that means, but I, I guess that's what I am. But I will go first, okay? Probably. It's not a very nice thought. I don't like it. But in 100 years, think about this. None of us will be here. Will it still matter 100 years from now what you've done with your life? If it doesn't, then you're relying on a wisdom that isn't from heaven. It isn't divine. It's earthly. Let's look at the second word to check for worldly wisdom, unspiritual. James says that worldly wisdom is unspiritual. It cares only about what it can see and touch. Now, this person may talk about God, but they don't really make any decisions with God in mind. Their life is not led by the Spirit, so to speak. I know a lot of people like that. That brings us to the third word, demonic. Now, James says that worldly wisdom is demonic. When we make God a side thought... When he is just a part of our lives instead of the center of our lives, Satan loves it. So if you come to church for an hour every week and then you give no thought to God whatsoever for the rest of the week, Satan has you exactly where he wants you. He loves it when you're just a God spectator. And I feel in our day and age, that's what's happening. That we come to church and we hear some great music and it gets us all fired up. And Danny preaches a wonderful sermon and we get all fired up by, by two o'clock in the afternoon. We've forgotten the whole thing and we lived a whole week without God at the center. Listen, God will either be our God or he will have no dealings with us whatsoever. He isn't going to share his role as God with anything or anyone. He won't stand by and say, oh, no, 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 it's, it's fine. You sit on the throne of your own life. I'm just happy you're paying attention to me for one hour out of the week. No, that's not the way it works. Our God is a holy God. He's not desperate for our affection. He wants our affection. He wants us to love him because he knows that it's good for us. But if we aren't interested in him, he won't force himself on us. He will let us go. So that's the warning. Don't live your life by worldly wisdom because it's going to go badly, not only here for you on earth, but it's going to go badly for you in eternity. Let's take a quick look at godly wisdom. I like this a lot better. Godly wisdom, James says that godly wisdom is pure. Um, it's a life that's 100% about God, not 99% about God and 1% about yourself. It's 100%. It's all in. It lives life, a life of peace and harmony. It follows the path of right living. It says no to impulse. It produces a life filled with good fruit. It chooses to lose itself and allows God to control it. It chooses to serve and be a doer of God's word. 
It is able to be considerate and put others first. It doesn't have to have its own way. It says no to pride. And this kind of life is beautiful, by the way. It's the one that I try to live. And people who live this way leave a trail of love and life and joy and happiness behind them. This is a faith that works. I want to share with you just three brief points that can tell us how to get godly wisdom. If you want all that stuff, listen. First of all, we need to ask for it. Look what it says here in James 1.5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given unto him. So what's the key word? Ask. All you have to do, according to James 1.5, is ask. Wisdom is what Solomon asked for when God said that he could have anything and, and he chose wisdom. And you know what? Because he chose wisdom, God ended up giving Solomon everything. Our second point, get to know God. Plug into your Bible. I, I don't know. I, I, Danny's asked us to bring our Bibles. I have my phone, and it's a little more convenient, but I brought my Bible uh, the last two times I've been to church, and there's something wonderful about that. I, I, I encourage you to bring your Bible with you. It, it really does a pastor good to see Bibles. <laughs> it lifts our spirits, I can tell you that. So plug into your Bible. Set a sign, uh, time in your day to read God's Word and to pray and then do what it says. There's an old preacher by the name of Dr. B.R. Lakin. You've never heard of him. This goes way back. I, I used to do a little work with Jerry Falwell. I used to sing on his show there. And I was there one Sunday when B.R. Lakin was there. And he said these words, I've never forgot them. In everything you do, do right. That could be a message. We could, I could have come up here and said that and gone home. That would have been a good message. In everything you do, do right. Here's what Proverbs 1 7 says It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, don't hate what is good for you, love it. Love God, love His Word, love His worship. Didn't they, I tell you, these kids do a great job in worship, don't they? Give them a hand. I, I tell you, they do a great job. So impressed. Make him the God of your life. If you do, you will be centering your life around the only thing in the universe worthy of your center. And when you make God first, you will find something you will find amazing joy. You will find a life worth living. And God wants this for you. Trust him. Trust him. And third, get into community. Now that simply means come to church. <laughs> Don't forsake the assembly. If you have to do it online, do it online. That's cool. We're, we're down with that. Proverbs 13, 20 said, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. The companion of fools will suffer harm. So surround yourself with wise people who have great relationships with God. Surround yourself with people who have a faith that works. Hanging around someone who has a strong faith, by the way, is contagious. On the other hand, if you surround yourself with fools, you will become a fool. Pray for wisdom. If you want to receive what God has in store for you, don't put faith in yourself. I tried that for many years. It doesn't work. 
Instead, seek godly wisdom. When you are seeking godly wisdom, there is a spiritual beauty that begins to flow from your life. Now, what is something beautiful? What makes something beautiful? Example, what makes a beautiful song? Harmony. These kids harmonized this morning. It makes a song beautiful. I grew up in a family of singers. I, I joined my three sisters on countless occasions in churches and camps and concerts. I used to stand on an accordion box when I was five and sing a little song called Heavenly Love, and I just loved it, and, and it was just great. I loved being with my sisters, doing all things. Other than the message of the song, our mother said that the most important thing was had perfect harmony. And when we did, the song was beautiful. And when we failed to prepare and listen to others and to each other, there was disharmony and the song was a whole lot less beautiful, I can tell you. So how can we apply this to wisdom? The outcome of worldly wisdom is disharmony. But the outcome of godly wisdom is harmony. There is a growing and beautiful order about our lives. As you seek God's wisdom and the notes of your life are in the process of becoming a beautiful song, there's order to it. There's a balance and a beauty to it. It doesn't happen overnight. Your life and your is a work in progress on the way to becoming a masterpiece. You know, to, this morning, if... If you want to seek some wisdom, or let's just say that you need to have a touch from God. I know there are people here ready to pray for you and to pray with you. If you are here today and you don't know Christ is your personal Savior, we have folks here today that will help you with that decision. The point is, our lives can be beautiful when we seek godly wisdom. And I encourage you to do that. Will you do that for me? It's been great to be with you today. Pastor Andy's going to come and finish out our service for us. It's a beautiful day. Pray for our pastor. I, I, I can't tell you how important it is to pray for your pastor. Pray for him every day. Will you do that for me? God bless you. It's great to be with you. Pastor Andy.